Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome to Heal Shit. On today's episode, wrestling news, spoilers, rumors, reviews, and predictions. And here are your hosts, Draven Brown and Dark Cold. Why? Because bad guys do heal shit. Um, I know we jumped the gun a little bit. The first show was supposed to be leading up to Mania, but a lot of storylines started to wrap up and kind of gave a better picture of what Mania is going to look like, so we wanted to go ahead and drop this first one for you guys. Uh, my co-host, as always, Draven Grimes. Say what's up, man. What's going on, my guys? Good to be here. Dark, how are you doing today? Not too bad, not too bad. Um, you know, uh, just a little bit about us, I think. Um, we're both workers. Um, we've been in and around the wrestling business for quite some time. Um, That's an yeah. So we have kind of a, uh, a perspective that some of the other um, podcasters may not have. We're familiar with building uh, storylines, familiar with agenting matches, all that good stuff. So let's go ahead and get into it. So uh, one thing that was hilarious to me is shots fired on the pre-show when uh, Ariel Hawani was on the the pre-show. I don't know if you noticed, but uh, uh, Ariel Hawani, who was a MMA commentator and starting to get a little bit more into wrestling, he was uh, he appeared on SmackDown on Friday, and then Tony Khan sent out a tweet that basically taking shots at Ariel Hawani because I guess they had an interesting uh, uh, interview together that wasn't quite what Ariel was wanting so Tony treated out tweeted out something like you know you're a hack and all this other nonsense and then on the pre-game show or the pre-show for Elimination Chamber last night um, Rosenberg who's on the uh, the pre-show panel said anyone who knows anything about this business will respect what you do and your your writings on this so it was definitely definitely a shot at tony khan for saying what he said about harwani on uh, twitter did you notice that uh i'm gonna be honest with you uh, we talked a little yesterday and i thought i would not really be able to watch the free show or probably the first 20 or 30 minutes of the actual pay-per-view itself mm-hmm. uh I did see the tweet yesterday uh, from TK, and I, I saw the whole exchange. Now, going back to the interview that you referred to in TK, um, I did watch that interview, and this right after the whole CM Punk, you know, elite debacle uh, with the fight in the, in the uh, after that show, uh, Tony was very standoffish in that interview as. That's, 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 yeah, yeah. Anytime he would ask a question of relevancy to current situations going on, such as the CM Punk thing, the other stuff, stuff like that, he was sorry, he was very standoffish, and he basically said every time that a particular question would come up. He cannot answer that at this point in time. Now, I get it from from a company standpoint. He's not on good terms to be able to speak on that. But at the same time, you can't just you know brush it off. You have fans. You have you know people in the locker room that don't know what's going on. They want to understand what's happening, why it's happening, what are your stance on this, and you know. In my opinion, you know, Tony did the best he could with what he had, but at the same time, I feel he could have gave us more, and that kind of upset him, which is what led to this whole little debacle on Twitter yesterday. Hmm. Yeah, I must have missed that uh, interview. And I think Tony Khan obviously has a brilliant mind. I mean, everybody talks about he gets his money from his daddy, but independently, he's a billionaire. Um, 
he, he created a software that all of the major sports leagues use, you know, uh, statistics and everything. He, he's a brilliant guy, but I don't, I don't love how he comes across in interviews. You know, he, he doesn't, uh, I don't know, I just, I don't think he shines on that stage. Um, but I, I, can, I can see where he comes from. It, to me, it seems when he's in the spotlight, when he's on camera, stuff like that, he seems just a little bit immature, I guess would be the word I would think. Like, I mean, even going back to when, let's go back to Brody Lee's memorial show. He felt very sped through. He was just trying to get everything out before he forgot it. Now, he's gotten better from that show to now, but it still seems he's still trying to find himself. And to me, if, as an on-air character, if you're not going to be able to perform the way that you want, stay off the air until you are comfortable. Yeah. But that, you know, that's just my opinion. Yeah, no, I feel you. And uh, I know that's a crazy little tangent. We're talking about the Elimination Chamber, but um, it was just funny how uh, I felt that was a uh, definite shots fired on there. So the show started with the Women's Elimination Chamber. Um, mm. Started off Natalia and Liv Tyler. Um, there's this one spot that I, I really liked where Liv was like, Irish whipping uh, Nat into the cage and then back into the ropes and into the cage and back into the ropes. I thought, I'm really liking um, Liv Morgan. She's, uh, I don't know if I said Liv Tyler before. If I did, I don't know what the fuck is wrong with me. Um, Liv Morgan. Oh my God. It's still early. Yeah, I love Liv Morgan. Um, her, she's getting kind of a... Uh, you know, kind of a, a hardcore kind of edge door character. She's, she, there was this one spot where she dove off of the top of the pod and did a, uh, um, like a, a roll up power bomb on Raquel Rodriguez who was standing on the middle rope. Um, you know, just some, a couple of cool spots in this. Um, I don't think there's any doubt who was gonna win going into this. I don't think anyone, I don't, I think, as far as I'm concerned, Asuka needs to go undefeated for the rest of her entire career. I think she's an absolute buzzsaw. She is legit. Um, uh, now that she's kind of brought her Connor character back with the, the lion head and the, and the face paint, I don't think, I think she should win the title of Mania and have a long run as the champion. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this. Um, I did miss everything about like the last four minutes of the first elimination chamber match. Can you tell me everybody that was in that chamber match real quick? Sure, absolutely. It was uh, Liv and Natalia. And then the next one in was Raquel Rodriguez, who I like. Um, I, I mean, obviously, I don't think she's quite ready yet for that kind of, for a title run. But, there, you know, I think she has a lot of growing to do, but I think she's going to be awesome. Um, uh, next in was Nikki Cross, who, I'm, I'm a fan of Nikki Cross. I like the, the completely unhinged way that she does it. Like, she's not... We've seen crazy characters before, but, like, she's loony been crazy. And I kind of dig that, you know. Um, and then the next person in was uh, Carmella. Um, there's a, you know, I like the Elimination Chamber matches because you can use the environment really uniquely. And we saw it in the Men's Chamber match too, but Carmella was like talking shit and then hiding in a pod. You know, it was like she was very uh, weaselly and opportunistic, I guess. Um, yeah. And then uh, after Carmella was in, the first person out was Nikki Cross. Um, Raquel Rodriguez. Let me stop you right there. Okay. Out of the six women that were in this chamber match, mm. I give two questions to you. Who is the only main eventer? And when I say that, who's the first person that pops off the, off the list? 
gospel, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Number two. Other than Oscar, who had a snowball's chance to actually win the chamber match? Other than Oscar, other than Oscar, um, just because of the role she's been on, I would have said Liv. Um, exactly. Now I, I bring that up because you know, all due respect to everybody that was in that chamber match, because that is one of the most simple matches in WWE history. Everybody else was mid card. And I'm not saying that out of disrespect. I mean, I've, I've felt mid card stuff most of my career. But when you have Natalia, who's been there since what, 2009, and has not really done anything or both, you have Carmella, who, yes, she's won money in the bank, but a lot of people will say she's gotten where she is because of what she has, not what she can do. You get what I mean? Mm. Then you have who was it? Ra Raquel? Yeah. Raquel, I think needed another year in NXT. She had an amazing run at NXT. She was handled properly and she was booked the correct way. But since she's gotten on SmackDown like so many others on NXT, you know, she's kind of just been pushed to the wayside. And then you have, honestly, who I thought was going to win, Nikki Cross. Mm. Because Nikki was so unpredictable, and you know it's so great to see her old character from NXT come back. Mm -hmm. I guess it's one of those things like Jr. used to say, "How can I miss you if you don't go away?" And I know every second of that Nikki ASH bullshit. I just wanted to see the old Nikki Cross back. And yes, I get it. That Nikki Cross is like in the sanity in that whole faction. And, you know, I love that group since day one, and I had nothing but love for that kind of a gimmick, as you very well know, because, you know, we're similar in that area. But, I mean, once Asta got in there and you saw what she could do, because I did go back and watch some of the highlights this morning. I didn't watch the entire match. But Asta was the, the, the spotlight of that match. It was made specifically to put her over to work beyond Bel Air at WrestleMania. But if that's the case, and that's where we're going to go with this anyway, why even have the chamber match? Why not, you know, do something else and just have one elimination chamber match? Because it's like the hell in a selfie group. It's starting to feel watered down. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, as we'll get into the elimination chamber match later on, the women's chamber match basically just felt like a, a, a placeholder match, especially going on first. And, you know, even going back to war games back in November, that match, the women's match, was actually, to me, more entertaining than the men's war games match because of the story that was being told in there. And yes, I get the whole bloodline, Kevin Owens kind of deal from the men's war games match. Mm -hmm. But I was more compelled story-wise by the women working back than the men's. And it, it's kind of like flip-flop here. Like, I knew Oscar was gonna win. Yes, Liv had an unbelievable showing from what I read and like what the highlights I did see. But nobody else, you know, came away better for it being in the chamber. Natalia didn't get shit out. Rodriguez or Gonzalez, whatever her last name is at this point, she, you know, she was the monster of the of the whole chamber, and it, yes, it did take two women to eliminate her. But I feel she can be used differently and better. Then you have Carmella, which yes, she talks shit all the time. That's always been her character since the days of Enzo and Cat and NXT. But to me, and this is no disrespect again, she just doesn't feel anything more than mid card. Mm -hmm. And it's because of how she's portrayed. Like, she has all the talent in the world, but that character is just, to me, feels like it will never get above me. And then who else? Nikki? Nikki has so much potential. Like, her, make her monster heal. Like, I know she's like three foot nine, <laughs> whatever, like she's the smallest one in the group next to Alexa, which we'll get on to her later on. But, like, she's so unpredictable and, at times, like when it's on screen, it's scary, and I love that. 
But at the end of the day, Oscar was the, the focal point of that whole singer match. So if that was the case, why not just do something different? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I think they need to get away. And, and I think it's something that uh, Triple H is talking about is getting away from the gimmick pay-per-views and like breaking those gimmick matches out into something that's important like this year and, and you and we'll get to it more in the men's elimination chamber match when we talk about it but like it even that match didn't mean anything i mean what happened you've got wwe who's spent 25 years telling us that the U.S. title doesn't mean anything and now they're trying to tell us that it's a huge deal like you're gonna have to have to do something a little better than just start telling people that it's a, a main event title I mean the U.S. title was an extremely important title in WCW in the early 90s. I mean, when you were U with the U.S. champion, you were the number one contender. That it wasn't a mid-card belt, it was the rite of passage belt. You were the number one contender yeah. to the heavyweight champion. And ever since the... But you see, the, see, but you see it, that's like the Intercontinental belt. Let, let's go back to, well, I think, it was like 2010, 2011, okay? Cody Rhodes had the Intercontinental Championship, right? And then he, he did the Facebook on it. He gave it the, the old school feel again, right? Then it felt important again. So, in a way, I can kind of see what they're doing since Roman 90% of the time is on SmackDown. And yeah, he has both world titles. But I'm still trying to figure out, A, why have they they haven't dropped one yet, which we'll get into later on. And B, if you throw some champion to run franchise, you're not on both shows. Granted, I get he has a, a lighter schedule, but it takes nothing to go out there and cut a promo. Mm -hmm. It takes nothing to go out there and make a parent for me. You don't always have to get physical. That's the great thing about being not only a champion, but a heel champion. You don't have to do anything. Just go out there and piss somebody off and you've done your job for the night. Right. With, with the U.S. title, in my opinion, I think they're trying to that Roman's on SmackDown 90% of the time and he has both world championships is trying to make a title relevant, kind of like Cody did and, and to another extent like Seth Rollins did when Brock was like sort of a part-time champion and he showed up for the four majors and you know he had the IC belt for like six, seven months and he was basically becoming the workhorse of Monday Night Raw with the Intercontinental Championship at the time. So I can kind of see why they did that for the men's Elimination Chamber match, trying to make that more relevant. But at the same time, it felt forced down my throat. And I didn't really appreciate it. Now granted, when we get to the Elimination Chamber match, there's a couple of spots there that I would like to go in detail with you. However, we'll save that for later on. Mm. So, so yes. let's go on to the next match, to the uh, Women's Elimination Chamber match, and let's continue. Yeah, um, and the next match, Lashley versus Brock Lesnar. This is definitely, <laughs> okay. this is definitely a feud that should have lived and died on paper. This feud is garbage. This storyline is garbage. With it, they have definitive, definitive endings to all these things, yet this was supposed to be the the third match, the end of the trilogy, and we have a, a BS DQ end. I mean, Brock Lesnar, the, the alpha male, has to hit Bobby Lashley with a low blow, and then yeah. it, 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 I don't want to see this match again in Mania. I, I, I don't want to see this match again ever. No. But, you know, it's funny. You know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of when we're like 12 years old. And SmackDown, here comes the pain just came out, right? And we go to the character selection list and we just hit all specials. Like, we just turn them all on. And that's what any Brock Lesnar match has felt like over the past, what, 10 years at this point? This was just a just finisher fan fest. Fan finish. That's all you do. And then Bobby has so much fucking talent, right? 
and he's really coming to his own. I saw Bobby Lashley in 08, you know, when he was doing the whole Umaga Bobby Lashley feud on ECW was in his zone mode. This Bobby Lashley is next level prime Bobby Lashley. This Bobby Lashley deserves so much more. Which is why anytime I see something referring to the Hurt Business and reforming it and shit like that, that I am rooting for it because Hurt Business was good for business at the time. Mm -hmm. Regardless, because you can have a real big heel faction on Monday Night Raw. And if they do it properly, and they can keep Bloodline together somehow, some way until Survivor Series, have them feud. I mean, this is going in the fantasy book and this is going to another episode, but get them like slowly build up the summer sand where they actually clash a little bit and then just keep building it up to rock the four survivors here to have them work war games. Granted, I don't know if starting to break up a little bit. He's still in. Okay, now now you're back. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. But anyway, have MVP just be full time managing because I he's at in his career as far as work. Sure. There's no doubt. Uh, but we'll we'll get on the, the fantasy book for another time. But with Bobby Lashley, he deserves so much more. And that little seed that was planted on SmackDown Friday night with Bray Wyatt and fuck it, let's call it out, Bo Dallas. Because we all know who the fuck's under that mask. Mm-hmm. You know, setting up a match between either Bobby Lashley or Brock Lesnar, I don't want to see either one. And he's, he made it very clear the winner of that match he's going to face at Mania. But why? Yeah. It's like, and it, it's like it's like the episode we're going to do in a, in a few weeks about very wide himself. Nobody's going to come out better because of that match. Mm-hmm. Unless, unless the only way I can see that happening is if Bo Dallas unmasked and does his own feud with Bray, but that also is like a very like tender subject because it's like we've discussed before, almost anybody that's worked Bray Wyatt since before the theme time does not come out better. It's almost like, you know, here, hold this shovel while I bury you kind of thing. And mm-hmm. you know, I don't want to see that. But getting back to the match itself, you know, nothing but F5, German suplexes, spears, uh, a couple of hurt locks or whatever he calls it. And you know, I can I can I forgive. Know, I that was my fifth break match. Not gonna lie, that, I knew that was gonna be my fifth break match. But I, I, I watched I watched it through against against better judgment when I wish I was my better judgment. But let's talk about the end of that match after the DQ. You know, Bobby yeah. basically on the ship. Yeah. Um, let me ask you. I understand going after Bobby continuously. What the fuck was the point of the referee box? I, I don't know, man. It, like, to me, as a monster, it 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 makes you. I don't know. I get. Are they trying to? to make Brock a heel again. I mean, he was doing so well as the as the babyface cowboy, but it doesn't make you look like a badass when you're 300 pounds of muscle and you start throwing around a 110 pound referee. I mean, it doesn't do anything for the gimmick. And I just don't see what the... I can understand destroying Lashley, all right? It happened at the end of their last match, the other way around. Fine. But... But again, it was overkill. That's my whole point. Everything after... If he did one more F5 after the bell run, cool, walk the fuck away. But put Lashley through the fucking table, giving the referee an F5 in the ring, and then outside of the ring afterwards, like... It was all overkill, and it, it, it was just tasteful. Well, you know what happened at the end of uh, Royal Rumble when when Brock was eliminated? His outburst was not part of the show. 
like when, when when he did the whole stairs onto the announce table and and attacking you know a couple of people outside uh, I don't know if he just I can't imagine he went into bit I'm sure he did it because he thought it wasn't you know gonna improve the spectacle but um, so I don't know if they leaned into that you know or if I don't, know, I don't get it, but it's, a, it's not a good look for him. It's, it's possible, like you said, but at the same time, you know, that makes me not want to tune in on Brock Lesnar. Like, yeah, he's unpredictable and shit, but he's still, I mean, we we bashed John Cena for years, years about the five moves of them. Mm. At this point, Brock Lesnar is the two moves of them. Yeah. He's suplex shitty, he's F5, he's one, two, three. Everybody. Mm. Everybody sees the same shit. And, it, and, and really, it started with that, that fiasco. I say fiasco because I didn't really uh, enjoy it as much as other people. When Goldberg came back in 17 and did that match of Survivor Series, it was spear, 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 jackhammer, pin. If I wanted to watch that, like I said earlier, I'll turn on Here Comes the Pain and I'll do it my damn self. Yeah. Or I'll watch. Goldberg. Goldberg's like 50 something now. Yeah, I'll watch him. I understand what he can do. Yeah. But. If I want to see that, I'll watch Goldberg from 97 when he was looking like Goldberg and doing it. You know, when it was believable. But. The, the match that they had at WrestleMania 20 felt more believable than the one they had at Survivor Series 2017. I know I'll get a lot of hate for that. And, you know, fuck you guys if that's how y'all feel. <laughs> But that's my opinion. That's the point of the show is to get our opinions out mm. so that y'all can converse with us so we can, you know, try to come to a middle ground. Yeah. So but that's, that's about all I got to say about the last of the Yeah, we probably, we probably we devoted probably too much time to that match because it was just <laughs> garbage. But I want to... I want to point out my favorite part of the entire pay-per-view, Seth Rollins as the Joker. <laughs> that was the best part of the pay-per-view. That was hilarious. No, 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 motherfucker. The best part of the pay-per-view was when Becky just came in with her fucking Christian Bell Batman voice. That was the best part. <laughs> hey. I, I have it saved on my on my phone right now so I can watch it anytime. It's Dude. The, the greatest thing that I was not expecting. I was expecting to like play the old stuff from WrestleMania 21, the, the Austin, the Triple H stuff. No, they have fucking Seth Rollins look like like a, a mutated baby child of the pro and Joaquin Phoenix is the Joker. Dude, I got The only thing I could think of the whole time was a meme I saw last year of the, that Joker seat from the movie and it's it's playing sexy boy all the way down the <laughs> Yeah, phenomenal work. It, it made me pop. I almost crashed the car on the way home watching that. Good shit, man. Yeah, it was. All right, on to the mixed tag match. Um, Edge and Beth Phoenix versus Finn and Rhea. And what really surprised me in this match was I figured that this would be a Rhea Ripley showcase because yeah. she's she's destined to to win the title of Mania. I thought this was going to be about Rhea Ripley shining, and it wasn't at all. Like this was about I don't know. This was about um, four people pretending to be FTR. <laughs> it was, you know, from from Finn Balor crawling under the ring to to pull Edge off to to the big rig finish. Uh, I I don't know what what that whole thing was about. If you know, let me know. But the only thing let's let's get to the match itself. Yeah. The match itself, um, Edge, phenomenal. He, he's been, you know, he's taking some time off and shit like that. But he's not missed a beat. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? He is, like, as good now as he was in 2009. And he looks that better. He, he's... He, he looks better, yes, but he works just as good. Like, yeah. he never missed a day. It's like, you know, Edge from 2009 got in a time machine, aged in the time machine, but just came out just as fucking good. Now, with Beth... 
I'm sorry I'm parking the way he does. You can tell she's missing stuff too. Yeah. You can tell that she's rushing in places she shouldn't have to brush. She's slowing down when she shouldn't have to slow down. And she completely you know that watched the match. And it's later in the match. But if you go back, when they did the double inverted sharpshooter spot, the, the educator, mm-hmm. as they call it, from there it just felt sloppy. Yeah. It felt rushed. Not on not on Edgar Ballard's part, but on the women's part. Go back yeah. and watch there. You're seeing Rhea, and God bless Rhea Ripley. Holy shit. Her, her, her attire. Thank you, Rest of Thank you. That's why I have two eyes, one for the top, one for the bottom. We talked about that last night. But her facial, anytime she got hit with a high impact move, she wasn't screaming, she wasn't over exacerbating everything. It was almost like that blank look. And I know that eye makeup was made like pop 10 times better, but her facials have always been like. Bottom. Yeah, no, I'm a huge Rhea Ripley fan. Um, she's just. You know, kayfabe, I hate her character, kayfabe, which is meaning she does it perfectly. She's amazing at what she does. Um, she had it. Like, she had the same it thing I saw from CM Punk in 2006 when he debuted in ECW. Like, mm-hmm. that same thing. Yeah, and, and, we're, and you're right about Beth Phoenix. I mean, she... <sighs> She wasn't very smooth. She completely missed breaking up that two count when. Uh, All that too, right? Yeah, when when Finn was pinning um, Edge, she completely missed that breakup. Um, one thing that I, I did kind of enjoy is uh, there was a spot where Finn was up on the up on the top, ready for the coup de gras, and it looked like Beth Phoenix chucked Dom from the they ground did. up and, and knocked that Finn mother, off. That motherfucker got yeeted from ground level to third floor. It's <laughs> crazy. <laughs> um, I uh, well, that's such a hilarious spot. Again, Dominic uh, Mysterio, man, I, I can't. I don't know if he's amazing at what he does or if he's horrible at what he does. But either way. Like, going back to his character, I loathe his character because of what he did to his dad. The disrespect that he's done every time, like, number a month. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you know. I kind of dig it because it's an evolution to this like green ass baby face that really had nothing there. So I get why they went in the direction they did, but at the same time, you see where it's going. You know Ray and Dominic are going to work mania. So instead of just trying to keep them away as far as possible, I would have started that at Rumble. Which, I mean, they kind of did. But, you know, Ray basically did nothing in that match. And I know he was backstage for that show. Oh, yeah. He was there. Oh, yeah, I mean, he had the, the arm injury or something, but he could have went out there and tossed the dominant, you know, get him eliminated or some shit like that, and start the seeds for that match, which guarantees he's going to be not done, but he'll fuck that match. Yeah, no, uh, I don't. And I'm... Let's, let's, go, let's go to Ballard for a minute. Mm. It's like Ed said in that, uh, that B-roll before the match, the high passage. Have you ever seen Finn Balor work on this level, be this intense, this so inert in, in his character, and feel so comfortable? No, I think, uh, one, I think Finn Balor is one of the top ten wrestlers on the planet. I think he is... Top five. Uh, top five. Uh, arguably, yeah. Um, I mean, there's a couple of people in Japan that I would put in the top five that might knock him out, but... Um, well, yeah, that's, that's in my top five, but... Yeah, yeah. so... Um, but no, he he's in his element right now. Um, the whole Judgment Day as a whole started off kind of clunky. Like, it, it wasn't... Yeah. When, when Edge was leading the Judgment Day, it just... It, it felt like a cheap... You know, a cheap knockoff of obviously what Edge has done in the past, but um, right now with the addition of, of Ripley and that, and and you know Priest is he's he's good. Um, I don't think he's you know 
the the, the, a suit, the crazy superstar that they're trying to push him as, but not not yet, right. not there yet. Right. But I've watched Damien from his Ring of Honor days. I know the kind of monster that he can portray, and the mm-hmm. kind of monster that they desperately need on Monday Night Raw. Mm-hmm. And he could do that spot. He just and I hate to say this, but I'm starting to dig Judge Bay more and more. He needs to leave Judge Bay. Hmm. He needs mm-hmm. to be that monster. Yeah. He needs to ride slowly. Because when he was doing the shit with uh, that um, Bad Bunny, when he was doing the tag shit with Miz and Morrison at that main, there was something there as a solo guy. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But with Judge Day, he feels like he's overshadowed by Dominic's story, by Finn being this next level Prince and Devitt from like 2011. Mm-hmm. And obviously, you get rid of which is now the focal point, in my opinion, of Judge Day. I'm interested to see what they do um, with Ripley. If, if she doesn't beat Charlotte, then they're then Vince must have booked it because it's going to be ridiculous. Uh, if if she's going to beat Charlotte, especially after building it up from rest, the 2020 WrestleMania and what's real loss to Charlotte, or the NXT Women's title of mine. So mm. the title that, and all it took the purpose is for Aina Venter is beneath them. And I'm, you know, no disrespect to NXT, I still think it was the greatest brand at the time. Of time. Yeah. The Hunter was running that, and you had the Era Boys. You had Shinke there, you had Balor rebuild himself, you had Tomato Champa, which was like the fucking guy at that time for NFT. Yeah. Again, no disrespect to that, but it's it's not Charlotte's time anymore. She she needs to start winding it down. She can be Charlotte Flair without a championship. I mean she's already a fourteen time women's champion yeah. if you include NFT down and raw. That's not including the tag team fights. Charlotte Fair Flair is already a made woman. Mm. She can run out the rest of his career. And I get, you know, trying to be like her dad and win as many titles and shit like that, but you don't always need to do that. Right. You know what I mean? Mm. Rhea needs the title. Rhea needs a hard push, a good six, seven month push for that title. So, but I'm, I'm curious, is, are, is she going to have to leave Judgment Day to go on to SmackDown? Like, it's... No. You know no. Because, I mean, at this point, yeah, there's SmackDown Raw, you know, rosters. But how many times do you see them intertwine in a league? You know what yeah, I mean? Like, that's true. Unless they do, like, another WWE draft and they make it specifically, if you're on Raw, you stay on Raw, and SmackDown, you stay on SmackDown. It don't really matter what brand you are on. You can go to fucking SmackDown and you can go to Raw. Look, look, at, look at Kevin Owens' situation. Raw guy. Was on SmackDown like 80% of January, right? Uso, SmackDown guy. Yes, they're the tag team champions for both brands. But you know, you see them bounce back forth just as much. Mm-hmm. Same with Solo, same with Sammy. Mm-hmm. I like the only guy that really hasn't, main event guy that hasn't like jumped from brand to brand and brand is because he's been out for months with that injury at the impact. Is Cody, but he specifically stayed on Raw since he's been back. Right. Knowing his opponents on SmackDown. <laughs> yeah. So again, you know, it don't really matter what brain you're on, in my opinion. Yeah, that's true. All right. So um, just to wrap up with with them, I think uh, I think Beth looked phenomenal as far as conditioning. Um, yeah. Her arms look yeah. amazing. Um, well, for an edge, her ass looks amazing as well. Yeah. Yeah, Could there's, there's multiple angles of that, I'm telling you. <laughs> um, all right, uh, so let's... Uh, that, match, that match was just... It was good, but it could have been better. Yeah. A lot of shit could have been slowed down. But that, that's, that's the only thing I got to say about that. Yeah, the I just... Machine at the end of it. Oh, going back to the Shatter Machine thing with the big rig. Uh, I don't know if you know, but Dax and Cash live in the same town as Edge and Beth. Okay. They live, they really live like 10 minutes from each other and they're like best friends. Mm. That, that's that whole call right there. Okay. So I was yeah, I just, my final thought on it is, is I just don't think Beth and Rhea had 
great chemistry in the ring. I mean, a couple of things look choppy. And you, you got to attribute yeah. some of it to ring rust. I mean, Beth hasn't yeah. hasn't been in the ring more than a one-off in, what, 10 years? Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. All right, so let's go on to the men's chamber match. We had Gargano, we had Seth Rollins, Austin Theory, Damian Priest, Bronson Reed, uh, and Montez Ford. Um, God, this was such this was such an entertaining match. It was fun. Um, from, couple of the, just from the very start of it to the to, to, to the very end of it. Was just, my my favorite part of the entire match was um, theory jumping back into his pod to get away from Gargano, but forgetting that there was a second door behind him. So <laughs> Seth Rollins is just leaning up against the open door on the other side. And then they jump in there and they both close their respective doors and just start going at, at Theory. He's a fifth sign of phone booth, as they said. It was, yeah, that was good shit right there. That was fun. Um, so let's let's go through who started and who came out and all that shit. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get our things on that. So we got the Gargano and Seth, which was fine. I feel like Gargano was definitely the odd man out in this match. Like yeah, you, you, you could tell he was not going to be the one to win. Yeah. Which I'll I'll get him out in just a minute. Am I? Um, you know, there wasn't any uh, eliminations until everybody was in the match, which, yep. you know, I, I knew was probably going to happen because, you know, they were going to give more time to the men's chamber match. But I thought the women's chamber match was paced better. Um, yep. So, pros and cons on that. Um, so, uh, and I was surprised that Austin Theory came in second. I figured that the title holder, even though I know it's random, I figured the title holder would would get his number called towards the end. Um, but uh, I mean, it, it kind of goes back to like war games and to a lesser extent when TNA did lethal lockdown matches. You always knew whoever had the best cardiovascular were going to be the ones that go in one and two. And in my opinion. I would have switched Seth and Montez. Which, by the way, Montez was my pick to win. I felt, especially after last night, he may have been what He is like so gifted. I had some questions about him oh, though. My. Some questions like, like, did he smoke something called crotch chop last night like he he <laughs> crotch chopped everybody before every big move like I mean, <laughs> you know that's what 104 like yeah that's what 100 like top five boys is angel and doctor and that uh, and but, and the, uh, the the people's elbow he tried to do like it was like he was just out there emulating folks for for a good portion yeah, of it. Good for a good bit, but I mean he does that in a lot of tag team matches. It's just not as prominent because you know he has Angelo there to like kind of break it up some. Mm -hmm. But dude, Montez showed. So much heart last night. He, yeah. he, he was balls to off. Let's let's get it out of the way. My my number one moment, malicious intent moment of the fucking show is that fucking spider monkey moonsault flip splash bullshit from like the very top of the fucking. When he climbed up to the top of the cage. Yeah, he went like a fucking spider monkey. Went up there. Up there. And did like that kind of like. Yeah. Ooh, he just yeah. ensured he somehow made his body to where he ensured he came down flat, you know, instead of having to, to swing out. It, yeah, it was I mean, it was the, a great spot. Um, another great spot was uh, there was this this moment where Seth and Johnny Gargano were sitting on top of the pod together you were bringing it up. and they, and they they kind of looked at each other and they're taking a break and then Seth just whoosh, just <laughs> open hand slap to the chest and then kind of a scary looking spot uh, Seth had uh, Gargano up for a powerbomb off of the pod which got reversed into a hurricanrana 
and everyone was there to catch Seth, but I didn't see anybody there to catch Gargano, who landed like right next to the pod instead of getting, you know, obviously Seth came off with the Hurricane Rana, but I didn't see anyone there to catch Johnny. The referee was kind of there to kind of like just let him off the pod. Like, not expensive, but like, get the fuck off the pod. Mm. No, you want like a scary fucking moment? That fucking Poison Rana Gargano gave to Bronson. Dude, I I, I saw that ending so fucking bad. Yeah. Mm. I cannot. I can't imagine 330 pounds taking a poison rana. But no. I, I, you know, quote me now. Three years from now, Johnson's gonna be the main event. Absolutely. He's got that look. He's got the the, the attitude. He's got. He's got it. Mm-hmm. He's the main event. Yeah. Now whether it's SmackDown Raw, if he jumps back down in a team, whatever. He's got it. He has championship acknowledgement from me. I want to see him do great things. And mm-hmm. he's been back. I'm glad he got this push in the Chamber match. But getting paired with the Miz is like, man. You know what I mean? Especially when you first come back. Yeah. But since then, he's gotten that push. And I'm, I'm so happy Bronson's back and he's able to do what he does. But let's let's get to uh, let's see. We talk about Montez. I've, I've stuck his dick enough. Uh, Bronson, that shit. Well, the first one out um, was Bronson Reed following the finisher fest. So we had um, we had three finishers in a row, um, yeah. ending with Montez Ford's ridiculous splash off the top. I mean, nobody gets the height in, in any company in the world. Nobody gets has the spring that Montez Ford does. I mean even when we're talking about if we're talking about Dante Martin, who is probably the next best as far as high flying goes. I've never seen this. Yep. Let me ask you this. Prime R V D. Prime. Mm-hmm. 2003 ish. Montez Ford now. Best rock splash. Just from sheer height, I mean, even at, even at his most athletic, he didn't get the kind of height that Montez Ford does. RVD didn't get the kind of height. I mean, I think RVD was spectacular in that everything that he did was unique. You know, the Rolling Thunders, the the uh, Van Terminators, the everything he did was was yep. groundbreaking. But as far as sheer athleticism, Montez Ford all the way. I'm um, sure we're on the same page. And granted, I love RVD. I'm, we're going to be seeing RVD at River City WrestleCon mm. June 11th or 12th or one of those days. Whichever day we're going. Yeah. Like if he signed for both days, so he's guaranteed to be there. And I'll ask him the same thing. I'll, I'll get him a chance. Right. You or Montez, who has the best friend in the past? Far enough. So we'll, we'll get the answer from the man himself. But yeah, what was it? It was. Um, you want to know who has the best it, frog it, splash in the business? Best frog splash in the business is Mark Briscoe's frog bow. Oh my god. <laughs> That's an elbow drop. That's not a splash. <laughs> it's froggy. That is froggy. <laughs> gonna, Mark and Jay themselves are going to be an episode. Mm. So maybe a few other, especially with me, and you know how I am with Briscoe's. Mm. But back to the match. Uh, you said it, it, I remember being three finishes, but I only remember the curve stomp and I remember the frog splash. What was the third finish that Rockin took? I want to say it was whatever Gargano's impact finisher is. is that roundhouse kick or the super kick? No. No, no, it, it was that DDT. That, that yes, the over the top rope DDT, yeah. Yeah, okay, so that into the curve and so the, okay, I'm with you now. I'll make sure that I was going to bother me until I found out. Okay, so Bronson Reed's eliminated, and then we move on. You know, there's just so many spots, and we'll probably spend the next 30 minutes just on this chamber match at home. Let's, let's just go over the finish of that match. And yeah. another fucking dick weed Logan Paul. Uh, I don't get it with him. Like, there are a lot of skinny tall dudes that can jump. Like, why 
him. Like I, I don't see any appeal in Logan Paul. Um, the, the thing with Logan Paul, he's he's athletic. Don't get me wrong. He puts the work in at the performance center. Mm-hmm. But counting Royal Rumble, he had four count of one, two, three, four fucking matches in his entire wrestling career. All WWE. Meanwhile, there's guys like you, like me, like Rip Ruiz, like fucking Dashing Cam, motherfucking Cha Cha Charlie, guys that put in the fucking work for fucking years. Can't even get a fucking break. Can't even get a dark match with WWE. But that motherfucker, just because he has a couple million fucking YouTube subscribers, he can go on fucking WWE and fucking do matches with the fucking is with fucking Roman Reigns and made it look fucking believable. Yeah. And then fucking the Royal Rumble, the fucking spot with Ricochet, dude. This motherfucker is literally drinking out of a fucking silver fucking chalice, getting fed with a silver fucking spoon, and it pisses me off from a worker standpoint, okay? Mm-hmm. This ain't me, like, you know, as a fan. This is me as a fucking worker, seeing this guy get handed every fucking thing when guys are out here on the fucking independent, that are on fucking B-roll shows like fucking NXT, fucking Impact, MLW, and fucking New Japan. That all these motherfuckers are killing themselves for a fucking spot on a WWE pay-per-view or premium live event, whatever the fuck you want to call it. It's a goddamn pay-per-view. But he's out there, and he's not only fucking being cocky as fuck, he's ripping off motherfuckers. He's ripping off fucking Hangman Adam Page, and I'm not the biggest Adam Page fan, but the buckshot Larry is fucking Adam Page's shit. The curse off is fucking Seth Rollins, and I get that was just, you know, throw some fucking some dirt on the fucking world. I get that. But, dude, you fucking rubbed me the wrong fucking way. And, you know, I'm, a lot of this shit, I, I say, no disrespect, dude, fuck Logan Paul. <laughs> From a worker standpoint, fuck Logan Paul and everything he's been handed. And I know Triple H has been 90% of this, and I respect anything Triple H has done over the past 30 fucking years, especially the last fucking year that he's had to take over everything with the company. But he, he's fucking up with Logan Paul, because eventually Logan Paul is going to be like the fucking, and I fucking hate to say this, he's going to be like CM Punk at the fucking press conference. Yeah. He's gonna be too fucking powerful for you to do anything but send him home and still fucking pay the motherfucker. You need to put a fucking leash on the piece of shit now and fucking make him go and fucking earn his way. Mm-hmm. And I've heard Triple H say, you know, he's he put the work in. Cool. We all put the fucking work in. I broke my fucking neck. I blown out both my knees. I've separated both shoulders multiple fucking times. Have I been on a fucking dark match? No. Have you been on a fucking dark match? No. Have you even been fucking acknowledged? Fuck no. But Logan Paul gets handed this shit. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna jump off my soapbox now because I'll be on it for another 10, 20 fucking minutes. But dude, fuck Logan Paul. Fuck the finish of the fucking match. Does Austin Theory need the fucking US title? Yes, he needs the fucking US title right now because it's gonna make him fucking relevant. And if he can make that fucking title relevant, like the title's gonna make him relevant, all fucking great for him. But this fucking Logan Paul bullshit and having him fucking ruin a perfectly good elimination chamber match is mm-hmm. bullshit. Fuck that guy. Yeah, no, absolutely. I can't echo what you said enough. I mean, we're talking, um, but I mean, I don't know. This isn't the first time that that unfortunately wrestling companies live and die on star power, and for some reason he's considered a star. But the fact that it's just the fucking case. Go back to like you did the fucking Royal Rumble 2001. Put fucking Drew Carey out there. Then. Bring, bring fucking general managers in on a fucking weekly place. Bring in fucking Bob Barker. Okay? Right. If he's fucking dead, drag his ass out of the fucking grave. Bring him to fucking Monday Night Raw. Don't put a piece of shit like fucking Logan Paul mm-hmm. on a fucking premium live event during your semi-main event during a championship match that you're trying to get that championship to be more valid than what it is. Right. You, you soured me on the fucking U.S. title because you fucking associated Logan Paul with that fucking match. Yeah. I mean, to, to put him into a match with Roman Reigns and to make it anything more than a, than a squash it was ridiculous. We did almost 20 fucking minutes. Yeah, yeah. They made fucking Logan Paul like a fucking a believable contender. And I get it storytelling, but at the same time, you knew, I knew, everybody fucking knew Logan Paul was not fucking win that fucking match. Yeah. 
No, he's just fucking chopped liver. But you're doing this shit, now you're trying to fucking bury fucking Seth Rollins? Right. And that's all, to me, that's all you're doing. You're fucking going to bury Seth Rollins. You, you pushed him from like this major fucking heel in fucking 22 to the shit with Matt Riddle and Cody Rhodes and shit, and that he's fucking over with the fucking fans. That fucking transition from heel to babyface was a natural fucking transition by the fucking fans. It wasn't pushed, it wasn't forced down our fucking throat. Mm-hmm. Everybody fucking loves Seth. Everybody. And last time you saw Logan Paul, he was a baby face. What fucking point? What's the fucking point of this? Mm-hmm. Is he gonna flip flop like fucking Big Show did? Work heel one show, work baby face not dude. It, Could be. That's that's not that's not how you fucking draw people. Yeah. You should if you were gonna have fucking Logan Paul work stuff, it should have been more after like fucking Monday Night Raw tomorrow night, have fucking Logan Paul come out and you know formally challenge fucking Seth Rollins. Not fucking screw him over. This to me felt like what Sean did to Taker that last uh, no way out before the WrestleMania that he retired. Mm-hmm. He jumped in there and screwed Taker out of the title with Jericho. That's what this felt like. It felt rehashed, but it felt it felt third party and it felt like shit. And I don't appreciate it. Hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about um, their U.S. title issues right now um, because they've done a really good job with uh, Walter Gunther and the uh, the IC title, like making it. And where the where the fuck is Walter on the fucking pay per view? Right. <laughs> that, where the fuck is Sheamus? Where was fucking McIntyre? Yeah. Three of SmackDown top talents were not on this fucking pay per view, but you put fucking Logan Paul on this fucking pay per view. Don't fucking laugh at me. It's bullshit. <laughs> you don't have the fucking Vader Bros out there. You don't have fucking Imperium, but you put motherfucking Logan Paul. Mm. So what? What? Why are they not? Why are they not? And we talked about. I, well, I brought it up previously. You know, just uh, briefly. But I'm just not getting the sense that the U.S. title is important, even now. Like, they, the last few years of Vince were admittedly horrible. And, but one thing they were successful in doing is completely burying the mid-card titles. They've done a really good job of making the IC title relevant. I just don't see how they're they're not doing the same thing with the U.S. belt. I mean, I don't I don't buy theory. Like when he was when he was Vince's guy, oh it was he. They might have, maybe they poisoned him against theory because of of how the, how he was booked at the beginning. But he's not the future in in my opinion. He's not that guy. And let me stop you there. Let me stop you there. Austin Fear, let's go to NXT. Okay. Right? What was he with NXT? He was uh, a talent signed from Evolve. Who had all the potential in the world at fucking 19, right? right. And he got put with Johnny Gargano, Dennis Loray, Sam Shaw, that's who we're going to call him. And, uh, 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 what the fuck is her name? The chick that fucking did the wedding gimmick with Sam Shaw. Anyway, he got put in that whole storyline and it built him up some. He shouldn't have been pulled from that and put on Raw. It was too soon for him. Mm-hmm. Because by that time, he was only like 20, 21. What other 20, 21 year old do you know that went on Monday Night Raw with a fucking guest Randy Orton. That's the only one. No, no, because he was a little bit older than that, dude. Was he? Yeah, he was about 22. But mm. so he came from OVW to Monday Night Raw. Now he had a couple dark matches on SmackDown, but okay. Evolution didn't start until he was well into his 22. Okay. But when it comes to Austin Theory, it's, it's the case of being pushed too fast, too soon, and now they're trying to backtrack with him. The, the whole Vince's boy and shit like that from last year, which was hot fucking garbage. 
because not as hot garbage as that stunner it took. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not talking about Vince's, I'm talking about Austin's. Like, the oversell was just too much. But Austin Fury has all the tools. He has all the potential in the world. And to me, that's enough for me to give him a chance mm-hmm. with the character that he's portraying now, which is kind of like a revamped character of his Evolve days, which I guess is which is why I'm giving it a chance. Mm-hmm. But that whole fucking uh, selfie bullshit that he was trying to fucking rip off Tyler Breeze from like fucking last year and shit, mm-hmm. that wasn't working. Everybody knew it wasn't working. We all saw the shitty fucking scary ass fucking selfies with the fans. Yeah. Motherfucker makes a fucking blind man cry. Okay? <laughs> But this character that he has now, it feels real. It's more gritty to me. And I'm intrigued on where it goes. Now, it's like I said, they gave him the title to try to make it mean something, but at the same time, they kind of gave him the title to make the title make him mean something. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It, it, it's kind of bubbled in there. But mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? With Austin Theory, he just, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion. He needs to go babyface. You switch him naturally into a babyface. You put him in a few with like give him somebody with some with some fucking experience, like Shelton Benjamin. Let him fucking work Shelton Benjamin for the US title. Remember what Shelton did for the US title. Remember what Shelton did for the Intercontinental title mm. when he first won it. Like he made that title mean something right. on both occasions. Shelton can take that guy and fucking work him and make him better. That's that's Austin's issue is like the the pool of talent that he has, however great they are, Seth don't need to be in the US title. Seth needs to be in the WWE title. Damien, Damien doesn't need to worry about that. He's part of the group right now. If you anything, focus on the tag team titles. Right? Then you got fucking Bryson Reed who just came back. He don't need any championship opportunities in my opinion. Right. Build that motherfucker up as a monster. Give him a six month run undefeated like Samoa Joe did mm-hmm. in fucking TNA, right? And then, you know, Johnny Gargano, he's just, I hate to say it, he's stuck mid card. So he is. He is, dude. You know, rehashing the shit with, like they did last night, rehashing the shit with Seth Rollins and Austin Theory when he was the Messiah, or rehashing the Johnny Gargano Austin Theory thing when it was the, the way or whatever the hell they called it in NXT. It kind of hurt Austin in a way because they keep pulling the past back. He's not the past. He's not even the present. He's future. He's still got five, six good years before he's even started in his fucking prime. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And and I get it. Everybody got soured on him with the Vince's boy thing and the selfish shit. But if people just give him a chance, like a blank slate, like just give him a six month, like little run give him a chance to like be this character without thinking back to bullshit prior, you probably have a different perspective on Austin Theory. Maybe so. Maybe so. Um, all right, well, on to what everybody was uh, waiting for. We got the Tribal Chief versus Sami Zayn. Um, I think they did an amazing job with building Sami Zayn over the past six, eight months. He's undoubtedly one of the top baby faces in WWE right now. Um, you think? Yeah. Well, I think that I, I've had this. I, I, when his music hit <laughs> and it did not fall off into that generic rock bullshit and it was worlds apart. <clears throat> can't sit there and tell me that that did not feel like CM Punk 2011. Of course, but he's in Montreal. Here's here's the thing that I, that I, you know, people have been asking me about this for the past, leading up until, you know, what are they going to do with Sami Zayn? What are they going to, you know, should they let him win the title? Should they let him win the title? And my response is, he's not that kind of baby face. Okay, let's let's compare Cody and, and Seth. I'm um, sorry, and uh, Sami Zayn. Um, Sami Zayn is the lovable underdog babyface. He is. Oh. He is not. He is not. Uh, Cody Rhodes is the kind of baby, the kind of white bread babyface that leads companies. He's he's the kind of babyface that should be the champion. 
But Sammy's not that kind of baby fish. Would you say the same thing about Cody five years ago when he was a new Japan? I don't know, but we're in two different places. I mean, he's uh, Cody's five completely years. reinvented himself. Martin was the very top of NXT. Am I wrong or am I right? You're talking about Sammy? Yeah. Oh, of course he was, yeah. What you're speaking now of Cody is what Sammy was five years ago. Granted, he's leaving brand to go to other brands, but at that time, NXT felt like it's own separate company. And when he left there and he started working Monday Night Raw, it was the same feeling. Yeah, but you can't you can't say that this is the same Sammy under the same circumstances. I mean, he's no. he's. He has taken it upon himself to completely revamp his character back from the conspiracy theory times, you know, when he started rocking that whole thing. But it's not. By the way, I do. Go ahead. I'm not gonna lie. I did. No, I, I had no problem with that gimmick too, too. I think Sammy is brilliant, absolutely brilliant, and he was the best part of the Bloodline storyline, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but I don't think that he's. I still think there are categories of baby faces, and he's his current character was built to not be the the face of the company baby face. I think, in my opinion, he was built, and he's got so much love because he's the the ultimate underdog. Yeah, right. Let me ask you this: if and I know this is probably going to fucking happen. But if WWE went back to two world titles, mm -hmm. could you see Sammy being one of the world champions? Right now. Because remember, the original plan was Roman versus Rock yeah. for night two. And then night one was supposed to be a three-way between Sammy, Seth, and Cody for a quote-unquote new world title. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't, I don't know how to answer that, because could he have it? Yes. Could he have a long dominant reign? I don't think so. It's not about the long dominant reign. Once you have that accolade on you, nobody can take that from Max Zack Ryder. He won the Intercontinental Championship match in that ladder match at WrestleMania. The next night, he had to lay down. Right. So he had that moment. Right, no. He and never had of course, anyone could win it at any time. I mean, Bob Backlund came back at 77 years old, was he? And he won the title. Uh, of course, he wasn't that old, but yeah. Um, so anybody can can win the title. Is it believable? I think so. Yeah, maybe. Um, what else are they going to do with Sammy now? But is yeah, they're going to. But here's the question: Is it is it believable for Sammy to beat? Gunther. Is yeah. it? Okay. Could be. Gunther. Could be. Is, is Gunther and Roman on the same level? Absolutely fucking not. Mm -hmm. It's just like that fucking shirt of Roman's. He's working on fucking God mode. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Gunther's not there yet. Gunther is still vulnerable, even with Imperium. Yeah. Is he a fucking monster? Absolutely. Was he a monster when he first showed up in NXT UK and had the longest reigning NXT UK title reign ever? Yes. Okay, let's not say Gunther. Let's well, let's not say Gunther. Huh? Somebody knocked Gunther off the throne. Right. Somebody knocked Roman off the throne. Why Somebody not? will. I mean, like I said, anybody can do anything, but but Roman has beaten Braun Strowman. He's beaten everybody. Do you, is it believable for Sammy to beat Braun Strowman? I don't think it is. Uh, but, okay, let's let's stop there. Which Braun Strowman are you talking about? Are you talking about pre-release Braun Strowman or, or this, this bullshit fucking gimmick character since he's been back? <laughs> because there, there are two different Braun Strowman here. I guess there are, but I mean, you wrestling to me is suspending your disbelief, and I just don't I don't see. It, it's not believable to me for for someone the size of Sami Zayn to beat somebody like Brock, Braun Strowman. I, I see where you're coming from. Uh, I mean, 
to each their own. I, I, you know, I've always been like the biggest Sandy supporter of no, all time. I absolutely love him. I love Sandy Zane. Sandy. This is not taken away from him. You know what I do? Sandy was not walking out of there last night, too. No. It set us on Cody versus Reigns night, too, right? But there was that, that glimmer of hope. <laughs> and there was the first time of that match, I was actually like, oh, fuck, he's actually going to win. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that fucking Superman punch into the Huluva kick, I thought that was it. I, uh, for a second, I was on the edge of my fucking seat watching it going, three. Oh, fuck, there was no three. And that's the first time in a long time I was on the edge of my seat. Not as, you know, somebody in the business, but as a fan going, oh, shit. It got me. I can get You know, the whole build up for it, for Sammy and Roman, like months and months and months and months and months in the making and shit like that, and I'm, I was so invested in it. But even just not knowing storyline, Watching that moment, I thought that was it. Yeah. Now, granted, the whole shit with the fucking Usos kind of kind of pissed me off a little bit. Felt a little tainted. Yeah. Because you know they they played it off very well. Oh, the Usos ain't fucking supposed to be here. We knew that they have fucking visa issues between Canada and the United States. So right. you know everybody was like, "Fuck, he ain't gonna be there." He was the one motherfucker that did not have a fucking visa issue that was not fucking there. So low. So low. So low. Yeah, I don't know what that was about. The same fucking result for Solo, without bringing the fucking Jimmy and Jay bullshit. Right. Same fucking Jay bullshit for the build up of fucking Mania. So where do you see, obviously, for those who didn't watch it, the Usos did come out. It looked like Jay was going to take up for Sammy. Um, Sammy went for a spear that Roman got away with. Leveled Jay. So now we have a situation to where in, re in the wrestling world, when wrestlers can't watch replays, he's going to say, okay, I got speared by Sam. So what happens from this point heading to Mania? I think he's conflicted as hell. Yeah. I think they'll play that card for about two or three weeks, Raw and SmackDown. They'll have Sammy try to <coughs> explain what's going on, right? But they'll have Jimmy in Jay's ear you knew Sammy was going to do that. Sammy's always been against you. You always had this feeling about Sammy. Sammy is not good for you. You are our blood. You are my brother. Let's go out there and beat the fuck out of him. And after he makes that fucking decision, and after, you know, he's bloodline through and through, like that week up to Mania, to that match, they don't, you know it's going to be Kevin Owens as a tag partner. Mm -hmm. It's as clear as fucking good, but they never named Kevin Owens because they still got that thing going between them. We saw it last night. Mm -hmm. There was no handshake or there was no really acknowledgement between the two other than, you know, now we're fucking even from Rumble, right? Have Kevin come out with the fucking footage showing the sidestep after he makes himself his taxi partner and say, end of the day, Roman played you two. Jay, you just got the worst of it. And now at WrestleMania, the undisputed tag team championships are coming home to Montreal. And still play the Montreal boys kind of deal. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So what do you that see? Point, no, what, I would do, what I would do is I would only have one of the tag team titles on the line. Put the Raw tag team titles on the line. Keep the Usos on SmackDown. Keep those. Put Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn on that. And start splitting the fucking brands up like they're supposed to be. He was out fucking merge the belts. Right. So, what do you see as the dynamic between the Usos and... Because, I, I mean, I think it's going to be set in stone. That's the tag team match that's going to be at WrestleMania. So, how do you think the dynamic is going to be between the Usos and Sammy and Kevin? Do you think it'll be at the point to where Jay might completely go back to the bloodline or do you see the two teams ending up in mutual respect to when the t at, the, at the end of the bell how do you see that dynamic the way i see it is like i said with the build up you know he's he's gonna go conflicting into mania right but it's his tag team championship reign on the line right so regardless you know he's got to be with jimmy there's going to be a setup to where Referee's gonna get knocked out somewhere, somehow, some way. I, I, you know, if I'm fancy booking it, that's what I do. Have them get knocked out with like a faint super kick or some shit like that. Have them out for a good few minutes. Get the similar predicament 
that happened at Rumble and it happened at last night. But Jimmy and Jay the fucking champ. Okay? Sammy's the one that's in trouble. Kevin's knocked out somewhere. Jim, Jay turns on Jimmy. He walks off. There's no hit. He doesn't hit him. He drops the fucking chair. This tag team title reign ain't fucking worth it if you, if you want me to choose between what's supposed to be my best friend and my brother. Fuck that shit, I'm out. Mm -hmm. They win the tag team titles then. That sets up an inner feud still within the bloodline, but who now? Who's the better? Who's so? Because we've always had that question ever since they debuted in like 2009 with Tamina. Who's been the better? Is it Jay? Is it Jimmy? And that's what you build up to WrestleMania Backlash and let the fucking blow up happen there. Because you know when Roman loses, because he's going to lose to Cody, mm. you ain't going to see him for a few months. He's going to take some time off. Yeah. It's, it's your common knowledge. You know, once you have a long title reign just gone, you, you disappear for a couple pay-per-views. Yeah. So it, it leaves you with Solo, Jay, and Jimmy. And now Solo's stuck in the middle of this two brothers shooting. So now it's up to Solo to try to reconcile what's left of the bloodline. Mm -hmm. Maybe Paul's going to be there. Maybe not. I'm not sure. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. That that could go two different ways as far as booking it. If it was me, I'd keep Paul Heyman off TV every week. Like only have him come up, come back to do build up to Roman's return. But at that point, you know Roman's going to come back baby face. Mm -hmm. So does does that feud end with Jimmy and Jay, and you know Jay gets over, and becomes the baby face, or they it's like just a mutual breakup, and they let them do some single shit on their own for a while before bringing them back? Because you can't have Jimmy without Jay on top. Yeah, agreed. Because I mean, the angle from like 2020, 2021, when they was when it was Jay and Roman working each other, and they had Jimmy come back now and then. I mean, I'll be honest, I didn't think Bloodline was going to happen at that point because of how Jimmy was portraying the character of you don't need to listen to Roman, listen to me. Now it's mm -hmm. kind of flip-flop. Right. Listen to Roman at all times. Don't don't listen to what fucking Sammy has to say or Kevin or what the fans say. Listen to Roman. Roman is the fucking head of this table. But it's going to be interesting, but if it was me, that's how I'd do it. I'd have Jay just walk out the tag team match, let them hit... Honestly, have fucking Kevin hit a pack of spout driver because, you know, everybody else fucking does Canadian destroyers. Mm -hmm. So have him hit his pack of spout driver. Have Sammy do the Huluba kick or whatever. One, two, three. Have them have this big fucking victory. And then have Jimmy fucking blame. Fucking Kevin. Mm -hmm. That way, you're feuding Jimmy and Kevin. You got Jay over here. You got Sammy over here. So any four of them can work singles together. But it's going to eventually build up to being who's the better Uso, Jay or Jim. It's an interesting way to put it, yeah. No, I'm just I'm excited to see what happens. Obviously, we'll talk more about that on our WrestleMania preview show and prediction show. But uh, I think that's going to do it for episode one, guys. Thank you very much for listening. Um, for myself, Dark Chords, Draven Grimes, um, we'll catch y'all next episode because bad guys do heal shit. Peace, y'all.